All right, so I'm going to be doing my presentation on acute bronchiolitis um, and with heated high flow nasal cannula. And then I'm going to further that and say what are some possible studies that we can do to optimize the flow rates for initiation of high flow with these um, bronchiolitic patients. So, bronchiolitis is an uh, acute lower respiratory infection that's caused by different viruses with coughing, wheezing, um, poor nutrition as the main symptoms. And a large po portion of kids will experience at least one episode of bronchiolitis. As much as 2 or 3% of all children will be hospitalized during their first year of life. Um, and it's the most common reason for hospitalization for children in many countries. RSV, um, which is respiratory cynical virus, is the most common virus that causes the bronchiolitis, um, especially during the winter months. Some infants, particularly those with uh, risk factors, will have um, severe course. Um, bronchiolitis is the most common medical reason for admission of children um, to ICUs, providing challenges regarding uh, ventilation, fluid balance, and uh, general support. About 20% of um, kids who develop bronchiolitis during their first year of life um, and studies from the USA have found that increasing rates um, in this age group. And it, it's also generally seasonal, so appearing most frequently in the winter months. Um, and for RSV, the same seasonal pattern is seen throughout the world, with most cases occurring from October until May <clears throat> on the Northern hem Hemisphere. Um, it's a disease with high morbidity but low mortality. Um, and death from respiratory failure and bronchiolitis is rare. I mean, the differences uh, may be caused by diagnostic procedures as well as uh, um, by socioeconomic conditions. Um, a study from the UK um, underlines that the mortality rate for bronchiolitis in children below 12 months is low and falling from 21.5 to 1.8 per 100,000 um, kids between the ages of 1 to 12 months from uh, 1979 to 2000, which reflects some improvements in our pediatric ICUs and our care. Um, the inf so as far as pathophysiologically, the infection starts in the upper respiratory tract, spreading to lower airways um, within a few days, and the inflammation in the bronchioles is characterized by peribronchular infiltration of um, white blood cell types, mostly mononuclear cells and um, and edema of the submucosa adventitia. Um, damage may occur by direct viral injury to the respiratory airway um, epithelium or indirectly by activating immune responses. Um, edema, mucus secretion, and damage of airway epithelium with necrosis may cause partial or total airflow obstruction, um, distal air trapping, um, atelectasis, and um, VQ mismatching leading to hypoxemia and increased work of breathing. Um, smooth muscle constriction seems to play a minor role in the pathologic process of bronchiolitis. And generally, patients who develop severe life-threatening RSV bronchiolitis are those with underlying cardiopulmonary disease, um, immunosuppression, uh, BPD, or history of premature birth. Um, in severe um, bronchiolitis, necrosis of, <coughs> of the respiratory epithelium, <coughs> excessive mucus production, and um, lymphocytic infiltration results in um, an edema um, and dense plugs of debris and subsequent bronchi uh, bronchiolar um, obstruction. And the IgE-mediated reactions and release of inflammatory mediators may result in exacerbation of acute obstruction and may contribute to the chronic um, obstructive uh, pulmonary dysfunction. And patients that are hospitalized with bronchiolitis will usually require some sort of supportive therapy um, or, and maybe sometimes even mechanical ventilation. And based on the studies I found, um, a trial of aerosolized beta-2 uh, agonists is reasonable in these patients, but for the most part, breathing treatments have not been proven to be very effective. Um, systemic uh, corticosteroids um, have not been provided um, to be effective, or proved to be effective either and have a limited role in the treatment of acute bronchiolitis. Um, and inhaled corticosteroids may be useful in reducing the severity of chronic wheezing that may follow acute bronchiolitis, and ribavirin may be considered in patients with severe illness um, or in those at high risk for severe RSV um, disease. Um, um, and so um, as far as clinical characteristics, um, <clears throat> bronchiolitis often starts with rhinorrhea and fever and gradually increases with signs of lower respiratory tract infection, including like tachypnea, wheezing, cough, 
Um, very young kids, particularly those with a history of prematurity, may appear with apnea as their major symptom, and feeding problems are pretty common. Um, on a clinical exam, major findings um, in the youngest kids may be fine um, inspiratory uh, crackles on auscultation, whereas a high pitch external wheeze may be prominent in an older child. But observation in infants may have um, increased rest to rate, chest movements, prolonged expiration, recessions, um, uh, um, use of accessory muscles, cyanosis, and decreased general condition. Um, and what's unfortunate is that there's not really any formal scoring system for the severity of bronchiolitis. Um, a suggestion for the grading into mild, moderate, and severe bronchiolitis is based on guidelines from New Zealand and Scotland. Um, it's kind of given to that table um, right there to the left. Um, of the screen. Um, and at my hospital, we use the WOB score, also known as the Work of Breathing score, um, which is on the right side of the screen. Um, that score is used to indicate how severe these patients are. And it consists of, uh, it's age based, of course, um, and we fill out, you know, respiratory rate, um, O2 sats on room air, work of breathing. Um, and then it adds up the score. And the higher the score, the more severe the patient is. And um, and this, but the only unfortunate thing about this score is that it's limited to patients under the year, um, age of five years old. Um, and so in one of the studies I found, um, they actually included kids with bronchiolitis from an outpatient clinic and the resolution of symptoms took more than 14 days. Um, and 40% of the kids and about 10% of symptoms after about four weeks and the medium length of hospitalization. In a large study, including children below 12 months, was only one day. In another study I read, um, the mean length of hospitalization was 80 hours. Um, and risk factors are male gender, history of prematurity, young age, being born in um, relation to the RSV season, pre-existing disease, um, such as like BPD or underlying chronic lung disease, neuromuscular disease, congenital heart disease, um, exposure to any environmental smoke or tobacco smoke, um, young maternal age, um, short duration, no breastfeeding, and maternal asthma, or poor socioeconomic factors. Um, but most of the kids um, hospitalized for bronchiolitis have no underlying condition. Um, now, as far as like the lab um, assessment, um, so except for pulse ox, there's no routine diagnostic tests that have been shown to have a substantial impact on the clinical course of bronchiolitis. I mean, recent guidelines and evidence-based uh, reviews recommend that no diagnostic tests are used routinely. Um, impl implementation of guidelines for the assessment and treatment of infants with bronchiolitis has reduced the use of diagnostic as well as therapeutic uh, options with a further reduction in cost and length of stay. The clinical course and management of bronchiolitis are similar and not influenced by identification of the viral agent. Um, but Identifying a viral etiology is shown to reduce the use of antibiotics and the number of investigations and length of stay. Um, depending on the setting, a viral diagnosis may be warranted for cohorting of patients and may reduce nosocomial infections, which may um, have an impact on the long-term prognosis of the child. Um, this is actually what I've been trying to do at my hospital um, up on our four medical floor. Um, I have meetings with the nursing supervisors to remind them that it makes it easier for staffing and treatment of patients when we can identify and cohort um, all these patients in a certain area. Um, and it makes it easier for our respiratory therapists to um, provide any treatment and uh, do their assessments. Um, but examining chest x-rays may increase the rate of antibiotic um, prescription without improving any outcome and less than 1% show lower uh, consolidation suggesting the need of antibiotics and an x-ray may However, be more likely to add positively in children with high and prolonged um, fever, OT sats under ninety percent, um, chronic cardiopulmonary disease, and um, kids in need of admission to an ICU or mechanical ventilation. Um, blood tests are commonly taken but are not of clinical value, um, and most patients are, are not recommended uh, routinely. Um, and tests should be included. Um, Maybe total blood count and C reactive protein if a secondary bacterial infection um, is suspected. Um, and electrolytes in infants with feeding problems and signs of dehydration. Um, blood gases are warranted and useful 
in infants with uh, severe respiratory distress and potential respiratory failure, and the RT-driven pathway for heat high flow in my hospital in the ER is upon initiation of high flow. We require a blood gas um, before we uh, before initiation and a blood gas an hour after initiation to see if we're truly making a difference um, and we can adjust our therapy from there. Um, as far as uh, general management, um, you know, uh, management of acute bronchiolitis is generally supportive and that um, as no medical treatment has been shown to improve important clinical outcomes such as length of hospital stay, use of supportive care or transfer to um, an ICU, um, and a conservative minimal handling approach seems the very beneficial, especially for the youngest age group under three months. Um, prone positioning may improve oxygenation is suggested for infants if they are carefully observed, and careful nasal suctioning may be beneficial in infants with copious secretions. Um, oxygen, of course, should be given in hypoxic infants with bronchiolitis and administered via um, nasal cannula or face mask. Um, there's not really a consensus on what level of OT SAT support we should be aiming at. Um, I know in the UK, the oxygen is commonly given to achieve um, a SAT of anywhere between 92 and 95, while the American Association of Pediatrics recommends a limit of um, 90% in otherwise healthy kids. And operational, um, observational studies um, indicate that a goal of 90%, rather than compared to a, a goal of 94%, has the potential to significantly reduce the length of ho hospital stay. And the um, AAP guidelines recommend a reduced level of monitoring as infants improve. Um, fluid and nutrition, um, maintaining hydration is an important um, part of um, the care of infants with bronchiolitis and respiratory um, distress due to increased work of breathing may cause an, um, inadequate feeding and eventually lead to poor hydration. For the tachypnean fever increases, fluid loss, potentially worsening the dehydration, um, oral feeding, may be sustained in milder cases if needed by a small volume frequent feed and breastfeeding should be encouraged. But um, a substantial part of infants hospitalized for bronchiolitis will be um, <clears throat> in need of fluid supplementation, um, either as IV fluid or with enteral feedings by a G-tube. Um, the advantage of IV fluids could be um, a lower risk of aspiration, no interference with breathing, but with um, the disadvantage of possibly um, creating a catabolic state due to low uh, caloric intake and bearing a higher risk of fluid overload and electrolyte imbalance. Through G-tube um, feedings, uh, infants may get a better nutritional status and nitrogen balance, but um, which may be beneficial for recovery, maybe a route for giving express breast milk. Um, and feeding via the G-tube can be given as boluses or continuously um, in case of major uh, respiratory distress. Um, so currently there's no sufficient evidence for or against the use of G-tube feeding in infants with bronchiolitis, but feeding by G-tube has been increasingly adopted and used as routine in some countries. Um, few studies have addressed the appropriate amount of fluid to be given during replacement in bronchiolitis. Um, guidelines recommended that infants should receive um, enough fluid to restore fluid loss and avoid dehydration, and the amount should not exceed 100% of daily fluid requirements, uh, normally set to 100 ml per kilo for infants under 10 kilos, um, but fluid retention due to inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone has been um, reported in bronchiolitis, and clinicians should be aware of possibly uh, causing uh, overhydration, and um, about 70 to 80% of the daily requirements may be recommended, especially with those um, in severe cases. Um, inhaled saline is another one. Um, inhaled normal saline of 0.9% is pretty common for these kids to increase cloning of mucus. However, I've not been able to find any randomized study comparing normal saline with uh, treatment, and normal saline isn't really suggested in current guidelines and reviews, which means no recommendations can really be given. Um, inhaled hypertonic saline has in patients with various diseases shown to increase mucociliary clearance, possibly through a reduction of an osmotic flow of water to the mucus layer and by breaking ionic um, bonds within the mucus gel. Um, recent meta-analysis, including more than a thousand infants with the um, mild to moderate bronchiolitis, concluded that the use of hypertonic saline may reduce the length of hospital stay and the rate of hospitalization. However, 
due to possible side effect of bronchospasm, all but a few patients received a combination with a bronchodilator. And the optimal delivery interval concentration delivery um, device remained pretty unclear. Um, as far now, as far as uh, now moving on to bronchodilators, um, in addition to bronchodilation, inhalation uh, um, with adrenaline may reduce mucosal swelling, which has led to frequent use in infants with bronchiolitis. Um, however, a clinically important significant effect has been documented for neither adrenaline or nor beta two agonists. Um, studies on short term effects showing um, conflicting results. Um, one study that I found on racemic epi um, does not improve important clinical um, outcomes such as like the hospital stay or the use of supportive care in moderate severe bronchiolitis um, in, um, in patients. And they found that treatment as needed rather than on a fixed schedule resulted in less um, in uh, resulted in less inhalation, short hospital stay, less of supplemental O2, and less ventilatory support. Um, and this was really seen in kids under three months, um, which also tend to have a negative effect of adrenaline compared to saline. Um, in supporting a conservative approach, particularly in this age group, adrenaline is therefore not recommended um, as a standard treatment in infants with bronchiolitis, but trial might be important in children over three months of age with a critical evaluation of effect with the respect to continuation of administration. And, so beta-2 agonists are not recommended for infants with bronchiolitis. Um, as far as steroids go, there's been a lot of articles I read um, that conclude that there are no beneficial effects of systemic uh, corticosteroids in children with bronchiolitis, neither on um, rate of hospitalization for outpatients nor length of stay for inpatients. Um, now to move on to non-invasive ventilation and invasive ventilation. Um, so everyone I'm sure knows what CPAP is, continuous positive airway pressure. Um, and it's been used with like a nasal tube or nasal mask um, or cannulas, whatever. Um, it's been widely used in kids with moderate severe bronchiolitis. Um, it kind of acts um, by recruiting collapsed airways and corresponding alveoli by giving um, um, a reduction in mean airway resistance, um, which further increases the emptying of the lungs during expiration which causes a, a decrease in hyperinflation and work of breathing and improved gas exchange. Um, documentation for the use of CPAP and bronchiolitis is somewhat hard to find. Um, one systemic review that I found concluded that the evidence supporting the use of CPAP to reduce PCO2 and respiratory distress um, is of a low quality and it's been not been shown that the use of CPAP reduces the need for invasive ventilation. Um, I have seen some patients receive Heliox, which is a you know a mixture of helium and oxygen. Um, and it's a very low density gas, so it can kind of travel through those very restrictive um, airways. Um, we do provide this to a lot of our asthmatics in my hospital <clears throat> as well. Um, and it may be a beneficial role in bronchiolitis by transforming the turbulent into laminar gas flow, um, which would improve oxygenation and the washout of CO2. Um, the combination of Heliox and CPAP has been evaluated in, um, in some studies, and they showed a, a, a drop in transcutaneous or arterial PCO2 and respiratory distress. But Heliox, without the use of a tight CPAP or combined with the nasal cannula, has been shown to be ineffective. Um, and uh, I don't know who is very familiar with um, non invasive NAVA. NAVA stands for Neurally Adjusted Ventilatory Assist. Um, you know, I felt like we at my hospital, Oakland Children's Hospital, we had so many patients who were on non-invasive ventilation who were getting, you know, NIV pressure control, NIV pressure support. Um, we we're trying all these different types of non-invasive interfaces, masks, RAM cannulas. Um, so I really wanted to bring in something different. So I, I really um, researched and I brought in NIV NAVA into our unit. And I did a little bit of a comparative study. Um, where we mainly focus on these bronchioloic patients who required more than just high flow. Um, we place them on the up, up to the physician um, expression, um, what we would, which mode of ventilation we would use. So um, I, I, I'm currently still working on the uh, comparative study where I'm collecting data on all these patients um, and seeing 
who has uh, which patients are actually having a, re uh, a reduction in um, on ventilation days and um, um, ICU um, length of stay. So as of now, the bronchiolitic patients um, who have been getting NOV, NIV NAVA compared to the patients who are on NIV pressure control, both with the same interfaces and such. Um, as of now, um, my data is currently showing that patients um, are actually are able to be weaned off the ventilator and are able to go um, be discharged out of the ICU um, actually a day earlier when they are on NAVA compared to when they are on NIV pressure control. However, I still um, need a larger um, study group. So I'm going to continue to um, collect data and then I'll let you guys know um, what, I, what comes out from that. Um, but kind of back to what I was saying regarding um, high flow, uh, I feel like the whole country is very high flow happy right now. Um, high flow has been increasingly been introduced um, as an alternative to nasal CPAP. It increases the pharyngeal pressure, um, leading to reduction in respiratory efforts and improving respiratory distress. Based on current literature and my own personal experience, high flow nasal cannula is very feasible and it reduces the need for intubation. Um, and uh, it's better tolerated than nasal CPAP and larger pediatric units have replaced CPAP with high flow um, as a first line non voluntary support in bronchiolytic patients. Um, the safety of high flow nasal cannula and CPAP may be arguments for the early introduction of non voluntary supports in children with moderate bronchiolitis, but mechanical ventilation may still be necessary in infants with insufficient support by nasal CPAP or high flow. Um, and risk factors are obviously what I kind of have talked about before, like prematurity, low birth weight, BPD, apnea, low SATs, poor oral intake, or severe retractions on admission. Um, and yeah, so I mean, bronchiolitis is the most common reason for hospitalization during infancy, um, being a burden for the kid and the family, and lots of costs um, in the healthcare hospital system. and. Um, there's many main principles for treatment that include minimal handling, um, uh, maintenance of O2 sat of fluid and balanced nutrition, and from my own personal experience, early intervention, um, I'm initiating CPAP or high flow, really do help reduce the work of breathing and length of stay for these patients. So I kind of wanted to talk about um, high flow now, um, how high flow works, um, and uh, especially with these little RSV bronchiolytic patients. So um, over the last decade, I would say that high flow has been increasingly been used for O2 delivery and neonatal and pediatric units. It's gradually replacing CPAP. Its use in pediatric departments is more recent and generally is restricted to kids with moderate bronchiolitis. Um, the cannula was first um, brought into ICUs now we see them a lot in the ERs, and now we are currently even using them during uh, out-of-house transports and in-house transports. Um, clinicians are quite um, rightly raising questions about where it should be positioned among the systems of um, NIV, such as high concentration face masks and nasal CPAP. Um, and its mode of action is, 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 it might seem a little simple, but it's actually a little more complex than one would think. Um, initiating high flow is pretty simple, but close to um, but close monitoring is very important, and the range of indications is also likely to broaden in the future. Um, so, as far as <clears throat> how it works, the mechanism of action of it, um, it's designed to administer a heated and humidified mixture of air and oxygen at a flow higher than the patient's inspiratory flow of ventilation. Um, there is currently no single or simple definition of high flow um, in infants. Um, I'll say it usually refers to the delivery of O2 um, or whatever, or blended O2 and air at flow rates greater than two liters a minute. Some people say, um, some authors or researchers um, adjust the flow rates on body weight and recommend using two liter kilogram, which provides a degree of distending pressure and reduces the work of breathing. Um, in pediatrics, I would say anything over six liters a minute are generally considered a high flow. And high flow uh, presents several advantages over conventional low flow oxygen therapy in terms of humidification, oxygenation, gas exchange, and breathing pattern. 
um, all due because you're um, exceeding that person, uh, that patient's minute ventilation and respiratory flow. Um, so as far as the gas mixture and the conditioning of it, um, it provides a relative humidity of nearly 100% with the gas warm tube, anywhere between 34 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius, um, compared with the low flow O2 um, or the high concentration O2 mass. High flow improves um, patient tolerance by reducing the sensation of respiratory distress and um, mouth dryness. And one study actually observed trace movements and demonstrated improved mucociliary clearance in comparison of high flow nasal cannula and conventional O2 therapy. And this effect is thought to explain the drop in exacerbation at episodes. Um, another benefit of gas conditioning is the um, improved respiratory flow, which further um, increases the feeling of comfort, heat, and humidified gas diminishes the resistance in the nasal mucosa induced by dry and cold gas, um, and a point that should be neglected given that these resistances make up nearly 50% of the total resistance of the respiratory system. Um, and a lot of studies have been shown that, uh, that, a higher, that a flow higher than the patient's inspiratory flow provides better oxygen delivery than low flow O2 and, or the high concentration oxygen mass. Um, and, and this has been explained as the effect of a high flow on the oropharyngeal dead space, the idea of that being um, that the high flow of oxygen washes out the end expiratory oxygen depleted gas. Um, in the next breath, the patient inhales pure oxygen, um, dead space without or dead space washout also reduces CO2 rebreathing. Um, the extrathoracic dead space is proportionally two or three times greater in kids than in adults, and it may measure up to three mLs per kilo in newborns and becomes similar to adult volume only after six years of age. So that means that the kids, or, or, or the younger a kid is, or child is, the greater the effect of a high flow um, on oxygenation and CO2 clearance. Um, now, here's the question that everyone always asks, like, oh, how much pressure are we generating with high flow? Um, and so a high flow mixture is likely to create a maximum positive pharyngeal pressure of about six centimeters of water during expiration. The pressure is determined not only by the flow, but um, different factors, like also by the ratio of the prong or nostril fit, whether or not the mouth is closed or not, which is a big deal. Um, the variations are pretty wide, actually. So in a physiological study I found on infants, um, they measured pharyngeal pressure over the course of a gradual increase in uh, um, flow up to uh, 7 liters a minute. Uh, when they indexed the flow to patient weight, they saw that the average pressure with a flow of 2 liters a kilogram per minute was about 4 centimeters of um, water. Unfortunately, despite the overall shape of the curve, they couldn't really predict whether a higher flow would provide uh, greater pressure. The pharyngeal pressure at a rate of 1 liter um, a minute appeared like a sine wave around the air pressure um, during negative um, being negative during inspiration and positive during expiration. Um, and the sinusoidal uh, shape persisted when they increased the flow, but inspiration and expiration both became positive after 7 liters a minute, thereby generating like a real CPAP. Um, and the pressures generated by the device prevent pharyngeal collapse, which may be very pronounced um, in some diseases, and it reduces the obstructive uh, apnea and supports the inspiratory effort. Um, when patient flow is limited. In infants with bronchiolitis, um, high flow nasal cannula reduce the electrical activity of the diaphragm and um, drop the esophageal uh, pressure swings, confirming the effectiveness of this therapy to reduce the work of breathing. Um, and the effects of CPAP differ um, with the ventilation phase and positive pressure at the beginning of the inspiration may compensate the inspiratory burden related to the um, autopositive and expiratory pressure um, and facilitating inspiratory flow. So positive pressure during expiration prevents small airway collapse, kind of like a stenting effect, and increases the expiratory time and reduces the auto peep. Um, as far as uh, lowering the energy expenditure, the burden on the inspiratory muscle, the respiratory muscles could be pretty high in these kids with obstructive respiratory distress. Um, the high energy expenditure may lead to respiratory muscle failure and recourse to mechanical ventilation. Um, the risk of decompensation is particularly high in young infants because their respiratory muscles are poorly equipped with oxidative fibers, which increases muscle vulnerability to excessive and prolonged work. 
Um, several features of high-flow nasal cannula suggest positive effects on energy expenditure compared with conventional oxygen therapy. Um, notably preserved mucociliary function, prevention of atelectasis, um, and decreased inspiratory work. Um, as you can see in this diagram, so like the left, the flow is indexed to a patient. Um, weight, a flow of two liters, greater than two liters a kilogram a minute, is associated with the mean pharyngeal pressure of greater than four centimeters of water. Um, in the other uh, diagram to the bottom right, and that's just pretty much the recording of pharyngeal pressure at one and seven liters a minute um, in an infant. Um, and now, as far as uh, just kind of like side effects and monitoring, um, high flow stands out from conventional O2 therapy because it gives a heat and humidified airflow that counteracts the unpleasant sensation of a dry mouth. Um, this nuisance is one of the major sources of discomforts um, for IC patients. Um, compared with other systems delivering CPAP, cutaneous tolerance is better with fewer skin lesions reported. Um, however, likely, uh, like any respiratory system, this device has drawbacks, like um, the noise level can reach um, about 80 dBs. Um, the decibel level is correlated with the flow. It may be higher than um, that generated by other CPAP systems. Um, there's recently um, three episodes of pneumos and pneumomediastimes that reported um, in some articles I was reading during high flow use. Um, the risk of air leak syndrome could be associated with inappropriate pong size. That includes a nostril lumen. Um, uh, another difficulty with this device as a substitute for CPAP is the great patient variation in pressure generated in the airways. Flow rates may be titrated to the evolving status of respiratory distress, but the safety of this practice is uncertain because subsequent change in generated pressures are not measured. Um, and here, um, it's just kind of like a little diagram for high flow nasal cannula initiation and monitoring. Um, and um, so the high flow system has pretty few parts. Um, there's there's a, there's a cannula, a flow generator, a blender, and a humidifier. Um, so where to initiate it? I mean, although most studies of high flow have focused on ICUs, there has been a lot of recent studies that have been shown that high flow can be used to manage moderate respiratory distress in ERs and during transports. We do all of those at my hospital. We use them in the ER, on the floors. Um, we have these antipod systems that we could do for out-of-house transports. <coughs> we use them for in-house transports. They're very well tolerated by our kids. Um, and one of the advantages of high flow is that it requires minimal tech technical skill to set up and apply. Initiating this type of respiratory support requires advanced experience in managing acute pediatric respiratory illness, an adequate technical monitoring, um, and a high staff patient ratio. Um, and the risk of decompensation um, requires very close monitoring um, in a setting that is equipped for rapid implementation of invasive ventilatory support. Um, and discharge from the ICU and transfer to a pediatric ward can be considered only once the continued improvement of these kids is well underway. Um, and the ward admitting the child will obviously need to provide close um, surveillance. Um, so now for um, the cannula, um, the prong caliber is adapted to the nostril size in order to allow for leakage and avoid overpressure phenomena. So the prong diameter should be about half that of the nostril and it may be useful for inf in, um, infants to reduce mouth leaks with a pacifier. I mean, I hit on this so much with my staff that that's like the biggest thing that we need to really focus on is upon initiation, we need to have the right prong size and make sure it does not completely occlude the neighborhood only takes up about 50% or else high flow cannot actually do what it's meant to do. Um, there's, uh, there's three different types of gas generators. The first type is a blender. It's connected to a system to humidify and heat the gas, and there may be a pressure relief valve that cuts off the flow when a predetermined pressure in the circuit is reached, and the practical consequence of this valve is flow limitation depending on the cannula size. There's another type when they use a turbine and a humidifier. Um, um, this system has the advantage of not requiring an external source of gas except O2, um, and it can't be used with neonates um, and its startup is sometimes a bit longer compared with other types. And the third is um, based on a CPAP or conventional vent 
with high flow noise candle breathing circuit connected to a humidifier. So um, as far as settings goes, um, infants and infants flow rates are greater than two liters a minute and maybe adjust the body weight. Um, for example, two liters a kilogram a minute and children flow rates are greater than six liters a minute and maybe up to 20 to 30 liters. Um, thus closer to one liter a kilogram a minute for FI2 is set to achieve a target set between 92 and 97. Um, the gas temp is set around 37 degrees Celsius. In order to reach optimal humidification, um, if the patient room is cool, it may be useful to insulate the tubing or to use breathing circuits with heating wires to um, limit condensation and the spray of water droplets into the, um, the kid's nostrils. I mean, and if the phenomena continues, the heater temperature can be reduced to a minimum of 34 degrees Celsius. Um, and just, you know, acute viral bronchiolitis. Um, clinically, these patients, uh, these infants, show signs of severe obstructive lung disease with a marked increase in respiratory resistance and re reduced dynamic compliance. The trapping phenomena is exacerbated by the change in the vent pattern and being characterized by rises in the respiratory rate um, and in the ratio of inspiratory time over the total respiratory cycle. And the, the gradual increases in um, and expiratory volume generates a positive and expiratory pressure or auto peep and the work of breathing is increased because at each inspiration the patients need their muscles to offset the auto peep and, and then continue the work for generating an inspiratory flow despite the increased airway resistance. So measurement of esophageal pressure helps to quantify the inspiratory effort um, required to ensure alveolar ventilation in this situation and the efforts that is about six times higher in infants with severe bronchiolitis than with a healthy infant. So applying oral pharyngeal pressure coolant to the auto peep generates an inspiratory flow as soon as the inspiratory muscles begin working um, and drops the inspiratory burden. So in addition, CPAP may keep small airways open by enlarging the diameter, um, having that stenting effect, which in turn would reduce respiratory system resistance. Um, and high flow use increasing in pediatric wars despite the lack of clearly established benefits in the medical literature, and this indication is most seen in literature um, is mo moderate severe bronchiolitis in patients and infants. <clears throat> but recent reports suggest that high flow can be effectively and safely applied to a broader spectrum of patient ages. Um, a diagnosis and the symptom is very attractive because of its simplicity and excellent tolerance. Um, and on a practical level, the treatment should be initiated in the ER or the pediatric ICU or to evaluate this effectiveness and um, identify as early as possible the signs of failure requiring appropriate respiratory support. Um, so right here, what I kind of uploaded, um, I guess is this is where my frustrations come with my hospital or just in general when it comes to high flow and bronchiolytic patients. So this is currently, um, I believe this actually is our acute care, our current acute care pathway that I, I wrote um, maybe a couple years ago um, for a hospital um, on how to initiate high flow and the, kind of like the weaning and the escalation pathway for it. And, you know, th there's no literature that, that backs any of this up. I mean, it's just, you know, starts high flow at six liters a minute and 50%, you know, kind of wait 60, 90 minutes. Um, after initiation, to, you know, get a gas or whatever, and then, oh, we can wean by ten percent every two hours. If this, I mean, there's no, there's no uh, evidence-based medicine in, in this, and it, it really drives me crazy. And it's just right, right now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like escalate the care a little bit, or uh, um, be able to, I guess, be like a little bit more aggressive. And I'm, and I've been going crazy trying to find more and more research about. Um, what can we do to find, um, uh, I guess, be more um, objective with our initiation or how we wean or how we escalate? Should we go to weight-based flow rates, two liters a kilogram, one liter a kilogram, half liter a kilogram? What would be the weight limit? What would be the age limit? What are safe and effective flow rates? Um, there's just not a whole lot of convincing literature regarding high flow rates, um, especially for initiation. I mean, I could say in the Bay Area and most of the country, there are no guidelines for high flow. Our current practice 
um, in the Bay uh, or Oakland Children's that if a patient's in the ER, we have those worker breathing scores that I showed you earlier. Um, if a patient has a worker breathing score of five or more um, and is actively retracting, then we place them on six liters, 50%. And then they have a PICU consult. Um, and once the intensivist from the PICU goes down there and checks the patient out in the ER, um, if they need to escalate the flow rates, just uh, strictly due to um, uh, whatever the physician feels like, the patient will either come to the ICU and we have unlimited flow. I mean, our cannulas are maxed out to 60 liters, which we would never go up to. I think the highest we've ever had a patient go to is about 45 liters a minute. And at that point, um, the patient obviously would need some sort of um, positive pressure ventilation, like a NIV or um, BiPAP of some sort, or even intubation. Um, and so, um, and if they if they seem stable in six liters, fifty percent, like kind of show right here in the middle um, of this pathway, um, then they can go to the wards, um, and they can go up to about eight liters. And if they need to go up higher than eight liters, then they need to have another PICU consult. Right now, I've tried to. Um, escalate the flow rates a little bit higher on the floors to kind of help us out in the ICUs, especially in the winter months when we have tons of RSV bronchiolytic patients that come in and um, uh, it just makes it easier on the entire um, hospital if we can go up higher on our flow rates. So I talked to the pulmonologist <clears throat> and the hospitalist, the intensivist. Um, so now what is I currently have in draft is that Upon ER initiation, um, if a patient's under five kilos, then we start them at any um, six to eight liters a minute. If a patient is between five to ten kilos, we start them anywhere from eight to ten liters a minute of high flow. If they're between ten and fifteen kilos, they go anywhere from ten to twelve liters a minute. And if they're above fifteen kilos, they go on twelve to fifteen liters a minute. However, this is just a consensus that was made amongst the physician, just saying, "Oh, this sounds good." There's no objectiveness to it. There's no literature-based um, evidence medicine right here. So what I, um, I mean, it just drives me a little bit crazy. Um, and so I really want to provide appropriate guidelines and protocols for our staff. So, you know, some studies suggest providing two liters a kilogram. I mean, I'd like, uh, like you kind of heard me say earlier in this um, presentation. Um, my question really is, where's the limit? What if we have a patient that weighs... 15 kilos, are we going to start them on 30 liters a minute? Um, how much is a nasopharyngeal pressure? Is that true? Is that truly really delivering? You know, is it safe or not? Um, and so, um, anyway, th but this is just simple guessing game. Um, and so I, I really, um, I'm, what I want to do is I'm planning on doing a comparison study that compares half a liter kilogram a minute, one liter kilogram a minute, one and a half liter kilogram a minute, and two liter um, kilogram a minute. Um, and um, this will obviously be limited to patients who weigh under 10 kilos. Um, like, for instance, if a patient weighs more, um, I'll do two liters a kilogram up to about 10 kilos, and then every kilo after that, I'll go up by half a liter a kilogram. Um, and then just kind of do like a little comparison study to see, uh, you know, are we making, do we see a difference? Do we see reduced length of stay? Do we see um, reduction in um, support? Um, you know, and just kind of get a little more objectiveness into all this. Um, there was one study that I did find that actually um, did something similar to what I'm planning on doing. They did a multi-center randomized trial during like the 16, 17 um, RSV epidemic um, to assess whether high flow with the flow rate of three liters a kilogram a minute would be more effective than two liters a kilogram a minute. Um, but uh, from what I remember, I don't really think they found um, their findings to be very significant. Um, but the conclusion to be drawn is that high flow and standard O2 were both effective in terms of um, uh, in terms of duration of O2 administration, which implies that early use of high flow nice cannula was not able to be altered um, the evolutionary profile of moderate bronchiolitis and high flow nice cannula on, in itself cannot prevent or reduce the pathological changes in the lower airways um, dominated by inflammation and plugging and the favorable effect of this technique on the vent perfusion ratio hasn't really been established. Um, the assumption that 
high flow nasal cannula would increase alveolar surface, improve VQ mismatch, and reduce ventilation um, homogeneities. It has poor um, physiological basis at one liter kilogram. The max flow is selected by some researchers um, and in infants with um, acute viral bronchiolitis. A linear relationship was described between the flow rate, index of the patient's weight, and pharyngeal pressure. At one liter minute, the pressure recordings appear like a sine wave, uh, negative during inspiration and positive during expiration. Um, and a flow rate greater than two liters a kilogram a minute was required to generate CPAP of greater than four. Um, the combined measurements of diaphragmatic electrical activity and esophageal pressure swings also suggested that the effectiveness of high flow nasal can at the same flow rate to reduce the work of breathing. And these data underline the value of the support to rapidly offset the patient's inspiratory effort to overcome intrinsic and expiratory pressure and to rapidly improve breathing pattern and respiratory distress signs. Um, but yeah, so overall, um, I'm going to be doing this study. And once I have my findings, um, I'll do another presentation to show to you all. Thank you for listening. And here are my references.